Hi, everybody. It's another joyous welcome to Alan Robson's Grizzly Tales. Now, have you ever cut your finger? And the first thing you do, naturally, is give it a good suck. Now, is this the first step towards cannibalism? When you are enjoying lovey-doviness with your partner, you are said to eat them if you adopt certain acts. Is that a precursor to the days back before we became sophisticated when maybe we ate human flesh? Cannibalism existed in Britain, it existed in America, it existed in Europe, Africa, South America, Australia and New Zealand. So, if cannibalism has been everywhere, Obviously, I've got to take a slightly closer look at it and point you in the direction of just some of the horrific cannibal stories. Now, you might think, oh yeah, but that was years and years and years ago. Even so, Captain Cook, from the glory that is Teesside, was eaten by cannibals on the island of Hawaii. So, even some of our famous folk have ended up getting chowed. So... Let's have a look at some of the world's nastiest and most grisly cannibal stories. Now, it is one of the crimes that fills people with the most revulsion and disgust, with the mere thought of someone eating another human being might make you feel ill. As for me, I was once sent a part of a human to eat and microwaved it, and it was kind of porky, frankly, kind of porky. But some people have become infamous due to killing somebody and then eating them. I just asked somebody for a bit and they were happy to let me have some. Here's just some of the nastiest of cannibals. I'm starting off with a guy you may not have heard of. His name was Austin Haruf. Now, he was arrested and the police in Florida said he was making <laughs> animal noises when they found him at the scene of a double murder in Florida. He was a student there and he murdered and ate the face of the couple of people that he killed in what seemed to be a random killing. He was on his hands and knees, literally, chewing cheeks and noses off this this couple and making those num num noises police arrived found him on top of a man called john stevens tearing off pieces of his face with his teeth the police got their tasers out and fired them three tasers into this 19 year old didn't even make him stop for a second then they set a police dog on him and he kept eating their faces. Now, this is not the worst cannibal story ever, but it is one of the more depraved. Now, there is somebody that we call the Milwaukee Cannibal. You'll know his name at once when I say Jeffrey Dahmer. This creature lured his victims to his flat, drugged them, and while they were still alive and semi-conscious, so kind of knowing what was going on, he would chop them up and start eating them. Often they would see him cutting part of their bodies away and chewing on it. He was a twisted serial killer. He was jailed for murdering 17 young men in America between 78 and 1991. Now the world, obviously shocked by his crimes, because he was arrested and he was only 30 years of age and he admitted to committing his first killing when he was only just turned 18 years of age. Bringing them back to his place, drugging them, chopping them up, eating them. Mind you, he didn't waste. The police found partly cooked human flesh all over his apartment as well as a half-eaten human head in his fridge. This Milwaukee cannibal, as is his nickname, 
He got 16 life sentences for his crimes, and some of these people that he chopped up and killed, he saved the bottom bit, and he was a necrophiliac too. Now, it just doesn't get grisly in that sucker. Anyway, karma being what karma is, and if you do bad things, bad things will come around to you. Jeffrey Dahmer was murdered by a fellow inmate in prison, and nobody misses him. Here's another name you might not know. Anthony Morley? Oh, he was once named Mr. Gay UK. Featured in newspapers, magazines, interviewed on TV, like the one show and stuff like that. And he savagely murdered his boyfriend, a guy called Damien Oldfield, and then cooked him. What Morley did was he slashed his boyfriend, his lover's throat, then stabbed him all over the place. After the pair had watched Brokeback Mountain in bed, in their flat in Leeds. Now, Anthony Morley was a trained chef, so when he carved up the flesh, he didn't just carve it up, he marinated it, he seasoned it with herbs, fried some of it with olive oil, and then had it with a few chips. He then stumbled into a kebab shop. Obviously, a human being isn't filling enough, and he was completely covered in blood and just wearing his dressing gown he told the staff that he'd killed somebody because they tried to rape him now he was already in bed with the man who had made love to him on many many occasions and there was certainly no need to even mention the word rape because if somebody tried to rape you the last thing you would want to do is eat them in whatever way you mean it I'm going to also tell you about someone who is nasty. To look at him, you would think he looks just like any other old fella. A codger that you see in the street. His nickname, once caught, was the Grey Man. Because he was totally grey. Grey tash, grey hair, grey suit, grey shirt. He was just grey. And his name was Albert Fish. He was a paedophile and he boasted to have either abused or eaten a child in every American state. He was arrested and they ended up convicting him for only eight murders, although he says he killed over 52. Six years later, Albert Fish sent the girl's family a letter graphically describing how he had murdered them and telling them how much he enjoyed killing their child and even more so, eating them. The letter was traced back to him who boasted to have eaten a child, abused and killed in every American state. He was executed by electric chair at Sing Sing Jail in New York City back in 1936. Now, I know a lot of you using this podcast would be very swift to say how important the internet is and how you get a lot of pleasure out of it. And I mean, other than porn, because that's a given. Well, don't be too happy about the internet because it can open dark, dark doors, as it did for a man called Armin Muse. He was convicted of killing and eating a man that he met on the internet in 2001. Bernd Jürgen Brands saw an advert on the internet that the cannibal had put on the website. And he was honest about what he wanted. He said, I'm looking for somebody who is willing to be killed by me and then eaten by me. Now, he made no secret of this. This was in a national newspaper. People looked at it and thought, eee, what a wag, what a joker, what a jester. Well, Bernd Jürgen Brands, a goth, decided to answer it. And he was taken back to Mew's farmhouse in Rottenburg, Germany, 
where he cut off Brander's penis. And they both tried to eat it. Yeah, Brandis was a sick puppy too. The killer then stabbed him to death, chopped up his body into tiny little sections before sticking them in his freezer. Investigators worked out, on getting what bits were left, that Muse had eaten about 45 pounds weight of his victim when he was finally arrested in December 2002. He was originally convicted not of murder or cannibalism, he was arrested for manslaughter, only manslaughter, because he claimed his victim asked to be killed. But this was overturned and he was found guilty of murder in 2006. Okay, you know he mentioned the Milwaukee cannibal. Jeffrey Dahmer, the press love a nifty name for a killer, especially when they eat people. So how about the crossbow killer, the crossbow cannibal? His name, Stephen Griffiths. To look at him, ordinary looking fella in a sweatshirt who lived in Bradford. Now, problem was, this crossbow cannibal idolised Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, and even filmed some of his crimes at his home in Bradford, and he called his house the Slaughterhouse. Absolutely obsessed with the Ripper. So, this twisted fella skinned three women, the same kind of women that the Ripper had been killing with his hammer, he skinned all three of them, then chopped up their bodies before cooking and eating their flesh. He told the police that arrested him that eating his victims was simply part of the magic. He was convicted of the murders of Susan Rushworth, who was 43, Shelley Armitage, 31, and Suzanne Blamiers, 36. Okay, let's have another cool press name for some scumbag that eats you. This guy had the eyes of a killer, there's no question. If you ever see pictures of this guy, you will know he was not ever destined for anything good on this earth. His name was Luca Magnotta, the Canadian cannibal. He sparked an international manhunt after he butchered his gay lover a guy called Lin Jun. He uploaded footage of himself repeatedly stabbing his victim with an ice pick. He put it all over the internet. Then he kept filming while he dismembered him and performed acts of necrophilia on his decapitated head and his lower bits and bobs. The Canadian police saw the full, extensive and dis even more disgusting version and said cannibalism had been performed. Magnotta then sent parts of the body to political parties and schools all over Canada that would get a lump of dead body. And like people who use the internet, there's an obsession about it. He was eventually arrested in a Berlin internet cafe while reading stories in newspapers about himself online. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in Canada in 2014. Not that long ago. Got to come up with another snazzy name for the press. We've already had a Florida cannibal. Rudy Eugene then became the Miami cannibal. He stunned the world when he stripped naked in the middle of the street in Miami, dove on a poor homeless man who was just sitting on the street begging for cash and started eating his face. The victim managed to survive the attack but was left badly disfigured because Eugene ate both of his eyes, part of his nose and one of his cheeks. He was believed to have been on the drug known as bath salts 
when he committed this horrific and brutal attack. He was shot dead by police after he stripped the homeless guy, Ronald Popo, naked and started eating his head. I know he said we weren't going to tell about grisly tales. These are disgusting. And they keep getting even more disgusting. What about Peter Bryan? Have you heard of him? Well, Peter Bryan murdered Brian Cherry, hacked off both of his arms and one of his legs, and then fried his brain in butter in February 2004. Now, Brian had already been in prison for another murder, but those experts, oh, we love an expert, those experts in mental health decided he was okay now. He was totally sane. He could be released on a community order and live his life outside of prison. There were two or three attacks, but nobody could say for definite it was him. However, nine weeks later, after he was sent to Broadmoor, he murdered another patient and went straight back to prison again. Now, last week, I told you about Andre Chikatilo, self-confessed murderer, rapist, and he ate 50 other people to make up for his impotency. He got sexual pleasure from killing folk. So, we've had a look long, hard and grisly at cannibalism. Let's move on. Now, just to lighten things a little bit, I'm going to give you a little bit of pop quiz trivia. Hey, didn't expect that on a grisly tale. Well, some of it's grisly. For example, they did a long-term report on suicides and they discovered that there's a link between country music and suicide rates. Wherever country music is played massively on the radio, the white suicide rate is higher than average. This is independent of divorce, poverty, the availability of guns. If you get a station that plays non-stop country music, the white suicide rate is higher. Okay, what about Wanganui in New Zealand? A 21-year-old man said that he had a bomb and he, when he walked into Star FM, the radio station, and he said he was going to blow the entire building up unless he could hear his favourite song, Rainbow Connection by Kermit the Frog. He didn't have a bomb. He got arrested. Now, we've heard of Phil Spector. He was a perfectionist in the recording studio, and yet we know have his murderous story with regards to his wife. But once he was working with Leonard Cohen, and Leonard wasn't doing a particularly good job, so Phil Spector pulled out a gun, held it to Leonard Cohen's head in order to achieve the vocal performance that he wanted Cohen to provide. And he did it pretty damn quick. Also, a lot of people talk about, well, what would you have played at your funeral? I know that's dark and a bit grisly in itself. See, henceforth, my little pop quiz trivia. Well, do you know that at a funeral service at All Saints in Gravesend, the music picked for his last rites was Rod Stewart's song, Do You Think I'm Sexy? with If You Want My Party. Yeah. Funeral music requests played at crematoriums. There's a lot of regular ones that you, you get. Wish me, look as you wave me goodbye. I'd like to get you on a slow boat to China. Happy days are here again. And of course, that Monty Python classic, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now, during the recording sessions for one of my favourite albums, probably many of yours too, Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, George Harrison complained to EMI about the studio's hard, scratchy 
Eisel toilet paper. One side was matte, one side was shiny. Couldn't wipe your butt with either side properly. So George Martin made an executive decision, took it boardroom level, and replaced it with soft tissue for the Beatles' bum cheeks. Let's talk Christian. Oh yeah, there's a few Christian radio stations in America. And they've got one in Vive in Indiana. And it was burgled and set on fire back in 1994. Their prime suspect, although they could never prove it, was a regular caller to the Christian station who got really angry when a DJ refused to play him Don't Take the Girl by country star Tim McGraw. Okay, what is the most requested tune at British funerals bar none? It's also one of the most requested songs at weddings. How could one song fit both of those things? But it does. From the film Bodyguard, it's Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You. In 1993, five prison guards from Idaho at the prison in Boise, they were accused of taunting death row inmates by playing a Neil Young song, The Needle and the Damage Done, during an execution by lethal injection. I would have thought hearing the music was the last thing they'd be concerned about. And finally, in September 1996, Sidney Ambrose of Clacton had to have medical treatment after clapping too hard at a Beverly Sisters concert. So let's head on to something else that we all consider a little bit grisly. I don't know about you, but I've found it murderously difficult to get any kind of treatment from a dentist. Not that we usually want treatment from a dentist, but when you do need it, you quite simply can't get it the way things have been over the last while. So I thought to cheer you up from the fact that you might need a bit of a filling or there's a, a little bit of a bit of wobble in your dentures, I thought I would tell you about some of the horrible ways that people have dealt with their teeth from history. As you know, Alan Robson is synonymous for the word grizzly, and some of these really are. Do you know the ancient Egyptians used to cure toothache by splitting open the body of a live mouse, then they would put it, still warm and bleeding, along the patient's gums. Hippocrates, you know the Hippocratic Oath that all doctors and dentists have to swear? Hippocrates recommended a toothpaste that was made out of three mice and the head of a hare. Let's move a little bit further forward. The first century Greek scholar Pliny, he said the toothache could only be prevented by eating two mice a month. He also recommended pervasive green frogs, the burnt heel of an ox, toads and worms as a cure for your bad breath. I would have thought that would have given you bad breath. The Romans also stopped toothache by tying toads to their jaw. They made toothpastes and mouthwash out of urine, your own whittle, and apparently, according to them, the best piss was Portuguese. In the 17th century, one of the cures for toothache was applying the sweat from the anus of a cat that had been chased across a ploughed field. The original method of taking your teeth out was put together by a bloke called Monzi. He was the resident doctor to the Chelsea Royal Hospital. You know where the Chelsea pensioners come from. He took a strong piece of cat gut, wrapped one end around the patient's tooth, then threaded the other end through a specially made bullet with a hole drilled through it. The bullet was loaded into his revolver and fired. Yes, the tooth came out and went straight through the guy's gum. Early British dentures were human teeth, pulled from the bodies of corpses. And also, the fashion for wearing dentures made from real human teeth went hand in hand with the time of the body snatchers. First half of the 19th century, toothing 
is what they called it, was big business. The teeth of a dead person who had a decent set could raise an awful lot of money. A lot of body snatchers, instead of taking the whole bodies, just pulled the teeth out, kept them in a nice box. So tons of teeth from the dead who died in the American Civil War were shipped over in crates to England to be worn by the rich and fashionable folk. Later on, there was a craze not just for dentures made for human teeth, but for human teeth transplants. Teeth taken out of one set of gums and put into someone else's. It was a dangerous practice and it encouraged poor people to sell their own perfectly good teeth for what was pennies back in the day. The practice went on right up till World War I. Artificial dentures, placky ones, were invented at the end of the 19th century by an English dentist who just didn't want to handle dead men and dead women's teeth. So cheap celluloid teeth became popular, but they didn't catch on because if you smoked, the teeth were highly flammable and set your mouth on fire. The 18th century dentist, Martin Van Butchel, he promised gums, sockets and pallets, formed, fitted, fixed and finished, without drawing stumps or causing pain. Amazing thing, and obviously, after all the pain that people went through at dentists back then, especially when there was no anaesthesia, um, you can imagine people going for that. But what he meant was, he would hit them over their head with a stick, or blowing a trumpet in the patient's ear seconds before a tooth was pulled. But he was more famous, this guy, because of his dead wife. She died, so he embalmed her with turpentine and camphorated spirits of wine and left her in display in a cabinet in his sitting room. The case had a glass lid so he could get in there and give her a kiss every now and then. Now, while we're talking about things that we do to look better, Let's talk about the curse of the rising brow. Now, we Robsons, we've always had a high brow. We've always combed our hair back. So it makes you look like you're losing your hair or you've got some form of patent baldness. So what about cures from back in the day for people who were bald? Got a few that I'd like to share with you. In 1916, a Viennese professor, Ludwig Steinach, he became famous for claiming that the male vasectomy was a cure for baldness and a loss of virility. Now, the process that was called then Steinaching, I bet it nacht as well, attracted thousands of patients to the professor's clinic, including the very, very famous Sigmund Freud. None recovered their hair, but many were affected by a whole host of serious psychological problems, poor health, and a massive number of them caught testicular cancer. The ancient Egyptians tried to cure hair loss with vapors oil and batsias. The Chinese believed they could prevent hair loss by eating rat flesh, raw. In Tudor times, it was believed that dog or horse whittle rubbed into the hair reduced the hair loss. A currently popular Panamanian remedy known as bladder syrup claims to cure baldness, impotence and bad teeth. The medicine is made from monkey bladders, green tea and honey, and it's $4 an ounce. It still doesn't work. Mexicans rub wax extracted from killer bees to cure baldness and hemorrhoids. One simply rubs it into whatever area you're having trouble with. A lot of Norwegian farmers still have a traditional cure for baldness. It's what they've used in Norway since the 19th century. What you've got to do is coat your head with cow dung for 20 minutes twice a week. In the 17th century in England, long before wigs became the fashionable thing, bald men would sew clumps of false hair inside the rims of their hats bit like a jimmy wig and they used to go out looking like they had a full head of hair. Henry Ford, the founder of the very very famous Ford Motor Company, always washed his hair in water containing rusty razor blades. He believed that rusty water was in fact a hair restorer. Now there is no 
known cure for male pattern baldness, which will leave you with your testes intact because baldness relies upon the male testicular hormone testosterone. Therefore, castration is the only plausible answer. Now, the side effects of castration includes the loss of body hair, your voice gets higher, and a tendency to get fat, to suffer insomnia, not able to sleep, a weak bladder, meaning you dribble everywhere, and poor eyesight. So is it really worth it for a head of hair? A head of hair? So let's head on to another grisly story, this time from Scotland. It is the story of Black Barony at Barony Castle. And there's always been a darkness since the castle was bought by the Murray family back in 1666. Sir Archibald Murray fought as a loyal soldier for King William II and his queen, Mary II. Now he was a fine and brave leader, known for his vision and the ability to inspire his men to fight. Yet, fast forward to World War II, Poland had fallen and many of their soldiers, sailors and airmen fled to Britain, the majority to the northeastern Scotland. The Black Barony, near Peebles on the Scottish borders, was perfect as a Polish higher military school, teaching their senior officers English and the British way of doing things. The castle later became the home of the 10th Armoured Brigade, commanded by General Stanislaw Maczek. At first, the Poles were instructed to get ready for the inevitable German invasion, but it never came. So instead, all over Scotland, the Poles defended ports, beaches, estuaries, airfields, radar sites, and operated most anti-aircraft guns, and they were responsible for the overall installation of barrage balloons. Now, there's one story of Barony Castle, story of a ghostly soldier who often shows himself to guests, and especially to people living nearby. Over 50 appearances between 1945 and 1970. They believe his name is Peter, believed to be Peter Wozniak, a driver once based at the castle who drove officers around. This Peter was said to have met a young girl in Peebles and fallen in love. Now, despite only basic English, they managed to communicate and decided to get married as soon as all hostilities ceased. Now, the war in Europe was slowly grinding to a halt. Germany had fallen and young Agnes MacLeish was planning her wedding. However, the regiment that Peter belonged to decided to sign up to go and fight the Japanese, and they all agreed to become part of the British Army. Poor Agnes heard this and panicked. She had already persuaded her dad, a landlord at the main pub, to give him a job. Well, Peter was not going with them. He'd actually decided to stay. And that very night, he borrowed, he stole, the officer's car to pay her a visit, to reassure her. But in his haste to get there, the jeep burst a tyre, fell in a ditch. In a time before seatbelts, poor Peter was thrown up against a tree, smashed to death and killed. And ever since then, his spirit has wandered around the grounds and the main road leading into Peebles. Now, I know many of you like a really good story from overseas. So let me take you to the Sunshine Island of Jamaica. Around the end of the 17th century, into the 18th, when women were usually second-class citizens used by men, used by society in general, one lady stood like a colossus against that stereotype. Her name was Nanny. Queen Nanny, in fact, the leader of a tribe known as the Maroons. The tribe originated in West Africa, where many slaves were kidnapped and brought on slave ships to the Caribbean. She was born into the Asante people, from what we would call Ghana today. She was well known as an outstanding military leader by her people, and also very much by the British settlers who found no way of controlling her. 
she led her tribe off the plantations and into the great First Maroon War from 1720, still at war with the British in 1939. She was a tiny woman with piercing eyes, yet her tribe's people believed that she had supernatural powers connected to the god Obia. When the tribe fought, this tiny screeching woman was always in the front with a machete in each hand, always the first to reach the enemy and the last to leave, usually covered in their blood. The British forces despised her because she was an expert at guerrilla warfare. She would never attack any group that she couldn't take, and this would lead to hundreds of British fatalities. The British even decided to enter the jungle in the central mountains to try and find and overpower them. Yet these white soldiers in full heavy uniform fell victim to heat stroke, disease and extreme discomfort without breaks of polio, scurvy and even the plague. Whenever they sent a group of men back to the coast where they had forts, the Maroons would then swoop down and kill them. Then, when the army of 400 men had been whittled down to around 60, they would kill one a night until the remaining 27 ran out of the jungle. Not only was Nanny an inspirational leader, she taught her people the old ways, the legends, the folk cures, the customs, the music and songs of her tribe, the Maroons. Other groups of Maroons on the Leeward Islands worked out a peace deal with the British in 1739, but Nanny was having none of it, knowing the British always broke their word, as they had with the Native Americans and South Americans. She knew, whatever they said, it didn't mean peace, merely a different form of subjugation. Instead, she would raid plantations, rescuing as many slaves as she could, stealing weapons and food, then burning the plantations to the ground. She rescued more than a thousand slaves, and others would escape to join in on her endeavour. The British claim that Queen Nanny was killed by a detachment of loyal slaves led by Captain Sambo, as they called him, a slave who had a real name of William Cuffey. His white lieutenant called him a very good Negro. Cuffey claimed that he had crept into a village and shot Nanny in the head as she slept. His battalion of slaves were then given the name the Black Shots, slaves fighting slaves, therefore protecting the white troops. Yet many people believe that this was a double bluff, for in 1740, part of Nanny Town was given to Nanny, who was still alive, and her family. By the 1760s, she was old and dying of natural causes, and she eventually died, believed to be around 80, an incredible age for that time. She is buried in Nanny Town, latterly changed to Moor Town, and she's in Bump Grave. And let us keep leaping around the world. We're going to Ireland next, and we're going to Limerick, a brigand by the name of Charlie O'Shea. Now, this all took place during the horrific potato famine which lasted 1845 to 1848, when around a million people died of starvation, at a time to make recent credit crunches appear utterly insignificant. By 1900, the population of the country had halved, many fleeing to foreign lands like America with their families, others just trying to survive and usually getting a disease and dying. Without food to fend off illness, most of Ireland's working classes succumbed, while the wealthy merely travelled to England or Scotland, returning once their lands had begun to flourish again. Yet during this dark time, men, previously of good character, would have no choice but to seek unorthodox ways of feeding their families. Charlie O'Shea and Keith Milligan were two decent, hard-working farmhands on the outskirts of Limerick, when suddenly there were no crops for them to tend, no crops to grow or harvest, and like thousands of others, they had no way to feed their children or their wives, 
some of them already suffering with pneumonia. Milligan suggested that they steal a horse from the nearby castle because the army had tethered a few in a field. Now remember, this was not for profit. This would be to eat. They selected the biggest, fattest creature and in the night, led it away, leaving a gap in the hedge so it could look as if the horse had just wandered away. And for a week and a half, both families ate well and O'Shea's wife, Deirdre, began to recover from the very thing killing thousands. So every day, the two labourers headed out on hunting expeditions, looking for anything to feed their folk. Some Irishmen at that time were so desperate, they were actually exhuming newly dead bodies and harvesting their flesh before it putrefied. In fact, it became so prevalent at the time that armed guards were put on graveyards to put an end to what is a disgusting and unsavoury practice. Yet strangely, cannibalism would continue. Just instead of taking already dead bodies, they would abduct anybody remotely portly, slaughter them, and then butcher him or her like a pig. Horrific times. Whilst in the houses either side of you, people just died as disease ran rampant. Now, over a year into the famine, and the Irish were not being given a welcome to America. They were thought of as illiterate peasants, and they met a hostile reception there. Yet the Milligan and O'Shea families were well and fed. They had stolen horses, trapped anything that crawled or hopped. They'd eaten dogs, cats, rats. They'd made soup of worms, frogs, toads, slugs and insects. They would do anything to keep themselves alive. Eventually, they had no choice but to target the farmer who had employed them. He had a huge dray horse used to deliver hops and oats to the local brewery. As the farmer tried to keep his family going, everybody had their own battle. Milligan knew that this would be the end of the farmer, but his family had to come first. So the unlikely horse thieves decided to break into his home first and find stuff they could sell, giving the farmer a chance to survive. They knew that he had a huge collection of brasses, and they grabbed them and were away. They sold it all to a weaver at a market in Tipperary and returned with a few vegetables that they'd actually had to pay a fortune for. On returning back, O'Shea said goodbye to Milligan and walked away. And as he did, there was a carousing in the lane behind him. Milligan had been arrested, and there was a warrant out for O'Shea, who had stupidly left the farm. With Milligan looking at 10 years in prison, a sentence tantamount to the death penalty, O'Shea delivered his few vegetables through an open window so his wife would find them. The farmer was prepared not to press charges, but the magistrate had told him that what would have happened if he disturbed them? Would they have shot and killed him? Otherwise, why would they take a fully loaded pistol? Now, Deirdre swore that to the best of her knowledge, her husband was over the hills and far away by now. O'Shea thought carefully where he could hide and finally thought that no one would even be looking for him at Milligan's house. Milligan had already been arrested. He had a few carrots and a turnip that he'd been eating and he took it to Olwyn Milligan to cook for her bairns. The courts had declared that anybody helping these thieves would be sent to prison with their entire family, so they mustn't find him there. He stayed in the cellar of her house for almost three weeks, when he and Olwyn began having sex, both missing their partners and realising that death could soon be for both of them. Around then, the children fell ill and a doctor was called, and O'Shea knew he'd have to go. Despite their lustful tryst, he deeply loved his wife and wanted more than anything to see her again, even if it were just one more time. So that night, after a passionate goodbye from Olwyn, he crept around the back streets of Old Limerick and from a corner stared at Deirdre, there in an upstairs window. In the candlelight, she seemed to shine as he edged closer and closer to try and attract her attention. Little had he noticed that an old soldier positioned nearby to watch for O'Shea returning 
had spotted him. He'd already sent a young boy off for the soldiers as the snow began to slowly fall. It was a bitter cold night and the thought of holding his wife just once more was worth risking everything. So he darted out of the shadows, running along the back lanes towards that shining figure in the window, and just as he reached the locked back door, he was just plotting to climb over it. When two strong arms pulled him back, he begged the men to let him see his wife, but they refused, saying that if she had been the one helping him, she would go to jail too, and the children. So they marched him down to Limerick Station House where they offered to cut his sentence in half if he told them who had helped him. Now, this was the difference between a chance of life or certain death, but he dare not say that he'd spent it in the arms of his best friend's wife. It would destroy his wife. And it would also send Alwyn and her children to jail and Keith would be appalled. So as far as he knew, the secret would die with him in that prison. For almost nine years, Despite the famine, his wife managed to stay alive, writing how much she wanted him back in her arms and legs. Milligan had died of bronchitis three years in, and his wife, Olwyn, was also writing to O'Shea, remembering the passion they had shared together. So on nearing his sentence end, O'Shea was still firmly between a rock and a hard place. So he'd replied to Walwyn, explaining that they'd only been close because of the situation and how much he really loved his wife and Ben's. She never wrote again, so he thought she'd accepted that. However, there is no fury like a woman scorned, and she had taken his letter to Deirdre's house. And on the day of his release, O'Shea bounded along those streets, genuinely desperate to see his wife and how much all seven of his children had grown. In all those long ten years, he'd only seen them once, not long after the trail. But by the time he got there, it was almost ten in the evening. He rounded into his back lane, screaming, Deirdre! Deirdre! There was a crinkling noise, a flash of powder, and a shot. The shot had hit him almost point-blank in the face, turning his face all black and sooty, except for the huge bloody chasm where his nose used to be. He fell onto his back as the gun was placed into his hand as if he had taken his own life. Deirdre claimed never to have seen him. His children, two of them now married, had been with their mother all night and he'd never shown. Mrs Milligan and her children were all sleeping soundly when they knocked at her door. To this day, no one knows who pulled the trigger and suicide was the verdict by the coroner. The true story was turned into a made-up story by the late, great Gary Moore in the tune Over the Hills and Far Away. And that's it for this podcast, Alan Robson's Grizzly Tales. We'll have some more for you next week if you can stand it meanwhile get yourself to robsonsworld.com and have a look loads of stuff for you to download pictures to see some of them ghostly and some of the things that we've got up to waiting for you to download and have a, a check out lots of stuff waiting for you and if you download anything there it will help us out big style thanks again for your time we'll meet you on another grizzly tale from me alan robson God bless you, and I wish you well.